No, O oh Prince, that between the years when the oceans drink Atlantis and the gleaming cities, and the years of the rise of the yellow-haired sons of Arius, there was an age undreamed of, when shining kingdoms lay spread across the world like blue mantles beneath the stars. Nemedia, Ophir, Brithunia, Hyperborea, Zamora with its dark-haired women, and towers of spider-haunted mystery. Zingara and its chivalry. Koth, that bordered the pastoral lands of Shem, Stygia with its shadow-guarded tombs. Hyrcania, whose riders wore steel and silk and gold. But the proudest kingdom in the world was Aquilonia, reigning supreme in the Dreaming West. Hither came Larson, the Reviewer, black-haired, sullen-eyed, thief, a reaver, a slayer, with gigantic melancholies and gigantic mirth, to tread the jeweled thrones of the earth underneath his sandaled feet. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. Okay, uh, now that we got that out of the... Huh, you know, I actually do come off somewhat Conan-ish. Black-haired and sullen-eyed. I digress. Hello, I'm Larson Halleck. Welcome to Manthropology. As I have alluded in several works, I am a huge fan of Robert Howard. His rich and sensuous descriptions of exotic civilizations. His stirring and hyper-masculine prose descriptions of battle. He single-handedly revived my love of literature. After spending the better part of a decade reading the emasculating re I hate white people bullshit that they make you read in public school. But we're not here to talk about his literary merits. We are here to discuss his surprising relevance to the field of anthropology. Yes, let us discuss those aforementioned sons of Arius. Because the idea is more accurate than you would think. And new research actually reveals that, well, the half-bright fictional anthropology that Babo wrote about is actually more accurate than the theories that cultural anthropologists have been pushing for the past several decades. What theories am I referring to? Particularly those that pertain to the Proto-Indo-Europeans, the Yamnaya or Kurgan people, the corded ware culture that arises several millennia ago, and the spread of Indo-European languages, or as they might have been called in previous years, the ancient Aryans and the battle axe culture. In short, there is a grain of truth to the fever dreams of Schopenhauer and Arthur Gubineau, and more than a few grains of truth to Robert Howard's less overtly white supremacist take on the issue. But note that I say grain of truth. While they are more accurate than the view that has been the consensus for decades, it's still not entirely accurate to the new research. But again, the stuff that most of us were taught in school is totally false, whereas Robert Howard's is only somewhat false. But we'll get to that. The best way we can discuss this is to look at the original theories, the reaction to the theories, and the most recent reaction to the reaction. And whenever relevant, I will flex my vocal muscles and read passages from Howard's bibliography. In the 1700s, when Europeans were first making inroads into India and other Asian countries, they noticed a curious thing. There were quite a lot of similarities between the Hindi language and European languages, loan words, similar conjugations, and similar sounds that would suggest a common root. To cite one example, to cite one example, the Indian word for fire, Agni, also the name of a fire god in Hinduism, sounds oddly similar to the Latin word ignire, or the English word ignite. For that matter, many Indo-European cultures have a creation myth about the seizure of fire from the gods to give to mankind. The mythology surrounding Agni seems oddly similar to the myth of Prometheus, which any educated European would have been well familiar with. They also couldn't help but notice the caste system, and how racially divided it all seemed. The high caste, the Brahmins, seemed very light-skinned, in most cases a sort of ruddy brown, but in some cases almost, well, pretty white-looking. With fair skin and light eyes, the white colonial authorities felt a closer connection to them than the inevitably shorter and darker skinned lower caste, and perhaps the ironclad hierarchy of the subcontinent appealed to the aristocratic colonials as well. Study of the Hindu religion also resonated with Europeans. 
conceptions of the All-Father, the God of War, the goddesses of hearth and home, ideas of long-forgotten golden ages of near divinity, descending into Iron Ages, or the Kali Yuga, all seemed very familiar to Europeans who had familiarity with the pre-Christian faiths of their culture. I will tell you of Niord and the Worm. You have heard this tale before in many guises, wherein the hero was named Tyr, Perseus, Siegfried, Beowulf, or Saint George. But it was Niord who met that loathly, demoniac thing that crawled hideously up from hell, and from which meeting sprang the cycle of hero tales that revolves down the ages until the very last substance of the truth is lost, and it passes into the limbo of all forgotten legends. I know whereof I speak, for I was Niord. The Valley of the Worm by Robert Howard since noticing things was not discouraged back then like it is today, the colonial authorities wondered, why is this the case? Was there a common route between Europe and India? This was contrasted to the Europeans' introduction to Far Eastern countries like China and Japan. While Europeans did have some admiration for those, they made it quite clear that they were nonetheless alien, radically different languages and philosophies and systems of government, certainly not anything like the white man. But India did have many similarities to at the very least, pre-industrial Europe. So the only question was, why and how? The first person to posit the link was English colonial administrator William Jones, who in a 1786 speech posited the idea that Sanskrit, more so than Hindi, and European languages were similar because they did have a common root, and the peoples had common roots as well. He posited essentially that large-scale migration, or perhaps conquest, had occurred throughout Eurasia, spreading this ancient proto-language as well as other things like the Bell Beaker pottery culture, which is also quite widespread. It seemed to make some sense, after all. What else would you call a sudden and abrupt emergence of language and material culture, if not migration or conquest? Volker Wanderung, if you want to use a more succinct term. These people, known to history as Aryans from ancient Vedas and Chronicles, suddenly became very interesting to Europeans. The idea that their ancestors were the very same as those who would overrun India and Iran. Note that the name Iran literally means land of the Aryan. While I lay at the doors of death, there was a secession from the tribe. It was a peaceful secession, such as continually occurred and contributed greatly to the peopling of the world by yellow-haired tribes. Forty-five of the young men took themselves mates and wandered off to find a clan of their own. There was no revolt. It was a racial custom which bore fruit in all the later ages, when tribes sprung from the same roots met after centuries of separation and cut each other's throats with joyous abandon. The tendency of the Aryan and the pre-Aryan was always towards disunity, clans splitting off the main stem and scattering. The Valley of the Worm by Robert Howard This was around the same time that Romantic nationalism was popular amongst intellectual circles, so the idea that Northern Europeans had any sort of link to these great exotic civilizations was galvanizing, as prior to this, many scholars of Germanic descent were glum that their ancestors were apparently unwashed primitives compared to the great civilizations of Europe like Greece and Rome. Now. Their ancestors were unwashed primitives that conquered the world and became great civilizations. The priest made the chief understand his purpose, and though extremely puzzled, Chief Gorm gave him permission to remain amongst his tribe unbutchered, a case unique in the history of the race. He harangued Gorm at length, whom he found to be an interested listener. Imagination reconstructs the scene. The black-haired chief in his tiger skin and necklace of human teeth squatting on the dirt floor of the hut listening intently to the eloquence of the priest, clad in the silken robes of Nemedia, gesturing with his slender white hands as he expounded of the eternal rights and justices which are the truths of Mithras. Aris was the highest product of an innately artistic race, refined by centuries of civilization. Gorm had behind him a heritage of a hundred thousand years of screaming savagery. The pad of the tiger in his stealthy step, the grip of the gorilla in his black-nailed hands, the fire that burns in the leopard's eyes burned in his. There, in that mud-floored wattle hut, with the silk robed priest on the mahogany block and the dark-skinned chief crouching in a tiger hide, was laid the foundations of empire. Aris saw his mistake too late. He had not touched the soul of the pagan, in which lurked the hard fierceness of the ages. His persuasive eloquence had not caused a ripple in the Pictish conscience. Gorm wore a corslet of silvered mail, 
instead of tiger skin, but underneath he was unchanged, the everlasting savage, unmoved by theology or philosophy, his instincts fixed eternally on rapine and plunder. The Hyborian Age by Robert Howard Northern European intellectuals devoted themselves to Indian culture, such as Arthur Schopenhauer and Arthur Gobineau, the latter in particular developing an Aryan master race theory, attributing all of India's achievements to its Aryan progenitors, i.e. aristocratic white people like himself. In a somewhat more sedate manner, Friedrich Nietzsche spoke highly of the case system. Let us consider the other method for improving mankind, the method of breeding a particular race or type of man. The most magnificent example of this is furnished by Indian morality, sanctioned religiously as the law of Manu. Here the objective is to breed no less than four races within the same society, a priestly race, a warlike race, one for trade and agriculture, and one fit to be a race of servants, the Sudras. How wretched is the New Testament compared to Manu? How foul it smells. The theory remained popular throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, with whatever truths the theory once had devolving into outright crankery, like the Atlantean root race theory of Helena Blavatsky and the pagan reconstructionist cult of Armanenschaft, which had such devotees as Heinrich Himmler and the other more occultically attuned higher-ups in the Nazi party. Indeed, much of the Nazis' theories of race and hierarchy came from l later corruptions of the Aryan race theory. And practically speaking, half-remembered dreams of toe-headed conquerors bringing the world to heel sounded like something they ought to be doing again in the present. So needless to say, when the dust cleared after World War II, theories of Aryan conquest suddenly became wildly unpopular, as well as the idea of racial science on the whole. That is, of course, somewhat understandable when seeing to what terrible ends they would be used. Unfortunately, as I've discussed in other videos, this led to the pendulum swinging way in the other direction to an opposite but equally ignorant extreme, a deliberate pacification of the past, in which overwhelming evidence of things like prehistoric warfare were willfully ignored or in some cases even suppressed to push an ideological point. See my video on the book War Before Civilization for a lot more on that. This has led to such intellectually bankrupt theories as the pots not people orthodoxy, essentially saying that the sudden appearance of corded ware pottery styles all over Europe around 5,000 years ago is not a sign of Indo-European conquest and migration, but rather a massive trade network. Stone Age globalism, you see, because it's a lot more likely that people who are just barely leaving the Stone Age and entering the Bronze Age would be establishing trade networks instead of, you know, murdering and raping each other. Oh, and sometimes you'll see this culture referred to as the Battle Axe culture, particularly in older documents, and that's because the two most common artifacts of these people are battle axes and pots. Both terms were used as early as the 1880s, but you see, corded ware will be used a lot more in recent years. Why? Well, probably because the name battle axe culture sounds really cool, and it might get young, high testosterone boys interested in anthropology. And heaven forbid that happen. Going back to India, the catalyst for all this theorizing, the new anthropologists criticized the past focus on caste and the implication that the caste system, and Hindu culture on the whole, was something imposed by Aryan invaders upon the darker skinned people to keep themselves on top for millennia. Instead, they claimed that the caste system was something imposed upon India by the British colonials, an argument that you will still see espoused occasionally today from some light skinned Brahmin until some dark-skinned untouchable will get angry and then the argument will go nowhere. But in recent years, research done by, reluctantly might I add, David Reich has shown that the post-World War II pots not people orthodoxy is basically completely wrong, and that pre-World War II theorizing on the subject, including that of pulp fiction writer Robert Irvin Howard, are closer to the truth. I was Hunwolf, a son of the golden-haired Aesir, who from the icy plains of Asgard sent blue-eyed tribes around the world in century-long drifts to leave their trails in the strange places. On one of those southward drifts I was born. I never saw the homeland of my people, where the bulk of the Nordheimer still lived in their horsehide tents amongst the snows. Year by year my tribe drifted southward, sometimes swinging in long arcs to east or west, sometimes lingering for months or even years in fertile valleys, plains where the grass-eaters swarmed, but always forging slowly, inevitably southward. 
Sometimes our way led through vast and breathless solitudes that had never known a human cry. Sometimes strange tribes fought our course, and our trail passed over bloodstained ashes of butchered villages. And amidst this wandering, hunting, and slaughtering, I came to full manhood. The Garden of Fear by Robert Howard Note that this is not to say they were entirely true. In fact, there were several glaring inaccuracies to these pre-World War II theories. The biggest one being that the most likely point of origin of the ancient Aryans is, in fact, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the Pontic Steppe, from Poland to Kazakhstan and all the grasslands in between. They would in fact spread westward and southward, crushing their enemies, seeing them driven before them, and hearing the lamentations of the women. So contrary to what Hitler and Powell's thought, the Aryans, or more accurately Proto-Indo-Europeans, were not in fact Atlantean Ubermenschen and the direct descendants of the Germanic peoples, but they in fact were the same as those Slavic Untermenschen they hated so much. Or to put it another way, the Slav and the German are much more closely related than they'd care to think about looking at their roots. They are both Aryans, as is basically everybody west of and including northern India, as they are all Indo-European language speakers. Indeed, when speaking purely of Iran, India, and other Southern Asian Indo-Europeans, they are still called the Indo-Aryans. But to an extent, I think even Hitler knew that. You can look up the Indisch Legion if you want to know more about that little bit of clusterfuckery. <clears throat> With all that being said, the idea that some group of people known as the Aryans conquered lots of territory and spread their language and culture throughout the Eurasian landmass is basically true, even though some aspects of the theory have failed to hold up. Even David Reich admits this somewhat lamentably, because bad people might use this information, don't you know? And I quote, Archaeology has always been political, especially in Europe. Archaeologists are very aware of the misuse of archaeology in the past. There was a very famous German archaeologist named Gustav Kosina, who was one of the first to come up with the idea of material culture. If you see similar pots, therefore you'll be in a region where there were shared people and aspects of culture. His ideas were used by the Nazis later in propaganda to argue that a particular group, the Aryans, expanded across Europe in all directions. One of the things the ancient DNA shows is that the corded wear culture actually does correspond coherently to movements of groups of people. I think there was a very sensitive issue to some of our co-authors, and one of the co-authors resigned because he felt we were, we were returning to the idea that migration in archaeology, that pots and people are the same thing. There have been many co-authors from different parts of Europe that share this anxiety. Well, considering that DNA analysis of some places like the UK show an almost total replacement of the original population by the corded wear Bell Beaker people, and then basically no demographic change after that displacement, perhaps there is a reason why good-thinking anthropologists are nervous. But the smarter, less ideologically constrained ones are at least willing to admit their massive ideological failure. Or, to once again quote the reluctant David Reich, still dreading that James Watson and Nicholas Wade are reading over his shoulder, time and time again we've learned in the past, ignoring the barbarians is a dangerous thing to do. I certainly don't think Robert Howard would have been so put off by this. In his work, people mixed with other people, sometimes sexually, sometimes violently. People lived with their lives nailed to their spinal cords. Civilization and savagery clashed eternally. Barbarism is the natural state of mankind. Civilization is unnatural. It is a whim of circumstance. And barbarism must always ultimately triumph beyond the Black River. I'm Larson Halleck, and I enjoy humanity in all of its splendor. And now a word from our sponsors. Hey folks, are you a fan of Larson Halleck and the Barbaric Gentleman? Of course you are, otherwise you wouldn't be watching. Do you want to help me out somehow? If so, here's how you can give me money. You can go to patreon.com slash Larson Halleck and give me some money. Or you can donate to me via PayPal, paypal.me slash Larson Halleck or buy my book. Otherwise, visit my Gab, my Twitter, and keep watching the videos.